Welcome, Age of Vintage Society. Italian ingenue Pierre Angeli appeared in dozens of films over 20 years and even won a Golden Globe in her short time in the spotlight. Her winning smile and coquettish demeanour made filmgoers and her co-stars alike fall absolutely head over heels for her in the 1950s and 60s. But had her career and life cut short by an accidental overdose of barbiturates? How Pia Angeli broke James Dean's heart. Make sure to watch the video until the end and leave your thoughts in the comments. If you are new here, join our wonderful community by subscribing to the Age of Vintage channel. Pia Angeli wasn't exuberant like Sophia Loren, vivacious like Gina Lola Brigida, or intense like Anna McNanny, but she was just as talented. What distinguished her from these women were an ordinary girl quality, a soft-spoken manner, a most delicate face, and the ability to deliver truly heartbreaking performances. Hollywood has found an actress who eludes the town's traditional classifications and whose unvarnished beauty and instinctive talent have already caused her to be called Little Garbo. She was a young lady with a spindly figure and wistful face, but a wealth of revealing expressions and a beautifully warming smile, and in her great strength of character is modestly but forcefully conveyed. Perhaps she took from real experiences the emotions she conveyed on the screen. Her personal life was filled with turmoil. The world lost her in 1971, still at a young age. Fame, glory and happiness did not last very long for her. Angeli was born Anna Maria Pierangeli, in 1932 in Sardinia, an Italian island in the Mediterranean Sea. Her father was a construction worker and her mother an amateur actress. Her twin sister, Maria Luisa, would also change her name and achieve limited screen success as Marisa Pavan. They had their wide eyes set on becoming film stars. One of the family's pastimes was going to the theatre, so the little girls were influenced by the glamour of 1930s cinema and we know how alluring that can be. Along with that of her twin sister, Angeli's talent was cultivated by her mother to make sure the two girls were able to make a living from the silver screen. Angeli worked ordinary jobs and on stage until she was found by a Hollywood scout. The family moved to Rome when the girls were three and then to California in 1950. At the age of 16, when Angeli was studying arts in Rome, she was discovered by director Leonid Mogai, who invited her to appear in Tomorrow Is Too Late. Her work was so impressive that she won an Italian award for Best Actress and caught the eye of MGM producers, who offered her a contract with the studio. There, she enchanted everyone with her beauty and simplicity. Pierre's first boyfriend in Hollywood was 28-year-old Arthur Lowe Jr., son of the boss at MGM. It wasn't long before American producers took notice and brought her stateside. She was signed by the studio in 1951 to a five-year contract at $1,600 a month. Not yet 19, she was soon dating Marlon Brando and John Barrymore Jr., although her real romantic interest lay with up-and-coming actor Richard Anderson. In 1951, she was given the title role in Teresa opposite John Erickson, it turned out to be one of her best films and was a promising beginning for the 18-year-old Italian actress. Teresa made her a star. The film follows a young man just out of World War II who marries sweet and naive young woman, played by Angeli, who helps bring hope to the veteran's life. Angeli's on-screen career is overshadowed by her many romances with her co-stars. Actors like Kirk Douglas, James Dean and Vic Damone, whom she married, were all obsessed with her. Hollywood was infatuated with Angeli. She won a Golden Globe for her portrayal of the young Italian woman and was quickly brought into the fold at MGM, where she starred in films like The Devil Makes Three and Flame and the Flesh by Day, while Hollywood heartthrobs courted her in the evening. Singer Vic Damone was in Germany on military service at the time and visited her on the set. Within two years, he would become her first husband. Later in 1952, however, she replaced Ava Gardner in Sombrero, a musical also featuring Sid Charisse, Vittorio Gassman and Yvonne De Carlo, and was photographed being escorted around Mexico City by the son of the nation's president. 
it told three stories of romance, drama and comedy. Angelie's character, a gentle family girl controlled by her father, is romanced by the charming but irresponsible Montalban. The same year she had one of her most memorable roles as Nina in The Story of Three Loves. As a young widow who lost her husband in a concentration camp, Angelie's Nina is unable to cope with her loss and tries to commit suicide by throwing herself off a bridge. She is saved by an ex-trapeze artist played by Kirk Douglas, whose life has also been struck by tragedy. He longs to gain back his lost glory, but must find a compatible partner, so he trains Nina and in the process falls in love with her, which by the way also happened to Douglas off-screen. Soon Angelie herself would be deeply in love as well, only not with Douglas. In fact, Pierre discovered she enjoyed dating famous wealthy men. Brazilian diplomat Raul de Sarandel and another Brazilian nobleman named Francesco Matarazzo escorted her about town. Actors John Erickson and Carlos Thompson all dated her as her star began to rise. After meeting on the set, she and Kirk Douglas began a whirlwind romance and were even engaged for a short period of time. It was 36-year-old Kirk Douglas, however, who spent most of his nights with her. Unfortunately for Pierre, he spent the rest of his time tongue-catting around, and she soon learned of his nocturnal wanderings. Tired of Kirk's two-timing, she ended their relationship and started dating Damone and actor Carlos Thompson. On her 21st birthday in June 1953, however, Kirk suddenly showed up and presented her with a Bulgari diamond engagement ring. Although Kirk was engaged to the nubile Italian actress, but that didn't stop him from pursuing his future wife, Anne. With Pierre Angeli back in Hollywood, Kirk discreetly romanced Anne. Still, he was insensitive enough to ask her to help him choose an engagement ring for Pierre. All Kirk's dates with the young Angeli had been in the presence of a chaperone. For a few months they were a couple again, but then she handed it back to him in December and began seeing other men again. Recording agent Bobby Weiss and young singer-dancer Tommy Rawl dated her more than once. She was being publicly seen with the Shah of Iran's brother when she attempted a reconciliation with Kirk. He refused to see her. A month later she was on a date with Jean Tierney's ex-husband, the notorious skirt chaser Oleg Cassini, when they learned that Douglas had just wed Anne Bidens. Pierre became hysterical and had to be escorted home. In 1954, Angeli was cast as the sweet and loyal Deborah in The Silver Chalice. She was lovely as the Christian who devotes herself to her faith in God and her love for the slave Basil, played by newcomer Paul Newman. One day after shooting, a dashing young actor working on a nearby set stopped by to visit Newman and another friend. They introduced him to Angeli. It was a meeting that would change both their lives. He was just starting his career in Hollywood and would become one of the biggest screen legends of all time. His name was James Dean, and he was working on East of Eden, his first movie. After breaking things off with Douglas, Angeli began a brief affair with James Dean. All the while, the rest of Hollywood lusted after her. His agent had suggested he date her for publicity purposes, the attraction between Angeli and Dean was immediate. Maybe they completed each other, for while he was wild and rebellious, she was peaceful and conformist. She could bring him the stability he didn't have, and he could bring fun and excitement to her. They began to date and were soon inseparable. On her 22nd birthday, Dean presented her with a gold bracelet and necklace, and before long he was a regular guest at the family home on Sunset Boulevard. The couple were soon spending their weekends at the Arrowhead Springs Hotel. Pierre's heartbreak over Kirk had seemingly evaporated. Little by little, Dean became more gentle and easygoing under Angelie's influence. Friends say he even wore a tuxedo for the first time to accompany her to a premiere. Apparently, they made each other very happy. But it was not all a bed of roses for the handsome Hollywood couple. In July, her mother discovered that her precious daughter and Dean were lovers, and she did not like it one bit. There was Angelie's controlling mother who did not consider Dean suitable for her daughter and forbade her to see him. She even tried to make the studio keep them apart. When Pierre threatened to leave home, however, Mrs. Pierre Angelie desisted. 
Dean and Pierre were deeply in love, but Pierre's mother forbade their union. Pierre also notes it emptied her to love. She complained to Jack Warner, who promptly carpeted Dean, and told him to stop seeing that broad. Dean, as expected, ignored the order. A month later, he proposed marriage to Pierre in New York City, but she refused to elope with him. Angeli wanted to marry Dean, but he was reluctant, though he thought she was the marrying kind. He was afraid of having his freedom restrained and of not being ready or able to take care of her properly. His indecision and insecurities hurt Angeli, who believed if he had such doubts, it was because he did not love her. All this pressure began to take a toll on their relationship. Her mother told her to choose between Dean and her. Pierre chose family and ditched him. One day Dean travelled to New York for two weeks to do a TV show, while Angeli stayed in L.A. When he returned, their relationship had changed. Though he and Angeli would still date, their romance had cooled considerably. Angeli began dating a young singer she had met while making a movie in Germany three years before. In October 1954, she started dating Damone again. Within a day of doing so, she announced their engagement. He was a rising star at MGM at the time. He was charming and had a magnificent voice, but most importantly he came from a Catholic Italian family and, unlike Dean, was not a rebellious type. He possessed a clean-cut image. In other words, Damone was the son-in-law of Mrs. Piangeli's dreams. They had a big church wedding in Beverly Hills on November 24, 1954. Legend has it that on this day Dean sat on his motorcycle outside the church with his red jacket, worn-out jeans, boots and leather cap, waiting for the bride and groom to come out. When they did, he hit the gas and sped noisily away at full speed. After their break-up, Dean was desolate and broken-hearted. Though he would have other affairs until his death in 1955, there would never be another Pierre Angeli in his life. No other woman would ever be so romantically linked to him. Douglas was staggered when they married in Hollywood a month later and then honeymooned in Las Vegas where Damone was booked to perform. By January 1955, Pierre was pregnant. Contrary to popular belief, friends present at the time vowed she did not even shed a tear on hearing of Dean's death in a road accident in September 1955. The same year, Pierre gave birth to a son, Perry Damone. What should have been the happiest time of Angeli's life was full of dreadfully low personal moments. However, she would not reach such dizzying heights again in her brief movie career. After giving birth to her son Perry, she starred in films like Somebody Up There Likes Me and The Vintage, but her marriage to Damone was falling apart. They had deteriorated to the point where she alienated her closest friend, singer-actress Anna Maria Albergetti, by making a play for her husband director Claudio Guzman. Her subsequent affair with Italian actor Maurizio Arena saw his fiancée attempt suicide. At the completion of filming Sodom and Gomorrah in the summer of 1960, Pierre gave a dinner party, inviting all of the lovers she had sampled during the filming. After cutting a swathe through numerous studs since her divorce, she opted to marry again, this time to an Italian band leader named Armando Travagioli a man fourteen years her senior. It was February 1962 and she had begun to drink heavily. By 1965 the marriage was over and they divorced in 1969. Her drinking and sleeping around had wrecked whatever love they once had for each other. In 1958 her contract with MGM was finished. She went back to Europe after her final MGM picture and continued to work on films like Musketeers of the Sea, and Estrelli Sus Fiestas. Her films may have grown more obscure, but she continued to be adored by people across the globe. Virtually single again, Pierre's reputation as a promiscuous drunk gained momentum, as she took many lovers, mostly personalities, from the underground of Italian cinema. Diagnosed with clinical depression in early 1970, she was treated with electric shocks at a clinic in Rome. Living and working in Europe didn't sit as well with Angeli as she thought, even as she continued to garner excellent reviews and BAFTA nominations. She went back to the States to try and get back into the studio system. However, by the late 60s, the star system was a shell of what it once was. She acted in a few more European films before starring in Octoman, a film about a mutant octopus in 1970. 
Unfortunately, this was her last role. In September 1971, her close friend, Dr. Raymond Spritzler, responded to a call from a highly agitated Pierre to come to her apartment. He administered a shot of Compazine to calm her down and then left. The next day, September 10th, he returned to find her dead. Pierre's family have always maintained that Spritzler was not only her friend but her lover as well, and that she died as a direct result of the Campazine. The once beautiful and talented Pierre Angeli had not lived to reach 40. In 1971, the 39-year-old actress was discovered at her home in Beverly Hills, dead from a barbiturate overdose. Her body was taken back to Europe. One thing does seem certain, however. She started out as an innocent, wide-eyed young girl before stardom and adulation turned her head. She enjoyed being a star, she liked men, and she got used to living the high life. And she needed to be loved. Sadly for her, the system and its denizens used her until her beauty started to fade. And when it did, the using became a two-way street that ultimately destroyed her. If you liked this video, don't forget to give it a thumbs up, subscribe if you are new here, and if you want to support my work, please visit my Patreon page. Now it is your turn. What do you think about the life and legacy of Pierre Angeli?